This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. So you might see some images, and I'm, I'm using quite a lot of quotes, obviously, from the diary, so it will help if you can follow them on the screen, but I'll try and speak slowly and clearly so you can understand what I'm talking about. <coughs> anyway, so 25-year-old farmer, Archie Barwick, had served in Gallipoli, and by 1916, he was stationed in France, along with most of the Australian Imperial Force, the AIF. In May 1916, he was looking forward to some leave, and he wrote in his diary, I'm looking forward to my trip to the old country. Of course, Archie had never visited England before. He was from a farming family in Tasmania, yet, uh, like most of the Australians serving in the war, he was nearly a few generations Australian. The Australian population in 1914 not only comprised people of British descent, but nearly one in five of them had been born in the UK. And this was actually higher amongst... Oh, there you go, yay! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so is it right, Aaron? Presumably. Yes. <laughs> um, so, uh, yep, they're the boys in London. Maybe it's... So, um, yes, there was one in five Australians, um, you know, were of British descent, but actually the men who were enlisting in 1915, one in four of them had been born in Britain. So to most Australians um, in the early part of the 20th century, Britain was seen as home, as the mother country, even though the majority uh, had not themselves visited. And of course, a highlight of a lifetime was a trip home to England. And for some men then, volunteering um, to serve meant it was an opportunity to visit the homeland. So I don't know if you can see, sorry, that's a, a recruitment pamphlet um, that was produced to entice men with a free tour to Great Britain and Europe, the chance of a lifetime. <laughs> so the Australians who arrived on the train from Folkestone into Victoria Station were mobbed by enthusiastic locals who reported Archie, who was there uh, to meet an Australian <coughs> friend. <coughs> Archie writes, waiting for the train, the first to come through the barriers and pass through the crowd was the British Tommy, and then followed the Canadians. When the latter appeared, the people raised a feeble cheer. I thought they were the last and no Australians had come, but still the people stayed there. I was about to turn away when, for some unexplained reason, the people began to surge towards the middle. Then all of a sudden, a mighty cheer went up and the girls waved their handkerchiefs and clapped the boys as they came swinging along, all dirty and mud-stained from the trenches, swinging along in the free and easy style which belongs to the Australians only. <laughs> Over 330,000 Australian soldiers embarked for overseas service in the AIF, along with over 3,000 members of the Australian nursing, Army Nursing Service. With the majority serving in Europe, almost all Australians serving on the Western Front between 16 and 19 would have visited London, um, either as soldiers or nurses on leave, or as hospital <coughs> patients working in hospitals, administrative headquarters, or even volunteering in the many, many uh, charitable organisations established during the war. Initially, the Australians were greeted enthusiastically by Londoners, as uh, evidenced by Archie's diary and entries. The Anzacs had certainly made a name for themselves at Gallipoli and their distinctive uniforms, their happy, charming demeanour and the fact that they were the best paid troops in the empire meant they were very popular in London, particularly with women. Arriving in an English-speaking country away from the horrors of the Western Front with much the feel of home, the men clearly experienced a sense of relief and enjoyment. London was an escape from trench warfare and being a tourist for a week or two was clearly a refuge. They wanted to make the most of their time in the metropolis. For some, this meant, of course, seeing all the famous sites that they'd heard about. For others, an opportunity to visit extended family. For others, it meant having a good time. And, of course, many Australian historians have examined this theme of uh, boys behaving badly in London, but it didn't take long uh, before the Australians' good reputation became soured and the stereotype of the overhear and oversexed became prevalent. Lurid reports of drunkenness, rampant prostitution, crimes of theft, violence were reported in English newspapers. 
the Times reported bad conditions in Westminster, the horse ferry road, rampant prostitution, the flaunting display of vice, a hotbed of immorality, undisguised and unchecked, prostitutes of all types and ages parade the streets and loiter at the corners. They solicit the soldiers who are about the district. No fewer than nine Australian soldiers were seen one evening recently coming out of a public house in this neighbourhood, all of them more or less intoxicated, each of them having a woman hanging on his arm. Perhaps the quintessential bad boy, uh, Australian soldier, on leave in London was Joe Maxwell. Uh, Joseph Maxwell, VC, was the second most decorate, decorated Australian soldier in World War I. In 1932, he's, he published his memoir of his experience in the war, which he titled Hell's Bells and Mademoiselles. <laughs> Needless to say, it is a rollicking read. His account of wartime London uh, is vivid, lively, filled with dive bars and bad women. Joe's account is one of many uh, that Australians are really drawn to. It plays up uh, the Australian love of individualism, dislike of authority and sense of humour. He wrote, With my feet firmly planted on the wharf at Folkestone, I felt like one who had returned from hell, from the mud and the duckboards, from the wine of the barrages, the infinite confusion and wreckage of war, to a spot where everyone spoke English. It was good to be alive. He went on, The pub seethed with men and women, here was life, pulsing, swirling, laughing, cooing. I felt as one returned from the dust and the yellow bones of a family vault. At tables, he wrote, cuties lounged and bandy phrases of Australian slang, and among the drinking, flirting troops, Australians predominated. Come sit here, Aussie. I've got the blues, she purred, fair dinkum. <laughs> through the blue haze of cigarette smoke, through a murk peopled by faces puffed and flabby from whiskey and gin, through a buzz of confidences, we got our first glimpse of war on the Piccadilly front. <laughs> However, I think the experience of most of the majority of Australians in London during the war did not necessarily conform to the over here and over six, over six bad boy image. The majority of Australians wanted a reprieve from war and wanted to see as many sights as they could fit in while they were in London. Reading the diary and letter accounts of these visits to London illustrates this move from being a, a soldier or a nurse into being a tourist. They became uh, an audience to London and in doing so provided a distinctly colonial response to British society. And I've drawn on the diaries and letters written by Australian servicemen and nurses held in the State Library of New South Wales collection. We hold a rich collection of personal papers, many of which describe wartime London. <coughs> The State Library's collection of, of diaries and correspondence was formed directly after the war. Diary collections written by servicemen were advertised for and purchased by the library. It was called the European War Collective Project, and it was the first of its kind. And earlier this year, this collection was added to the UNESCO Memory of the World mm -hmm. Register. In the past few years, the library has uh, digitised this collection and has had many uh, dedicated volunteers actually transcribing each volume. Um, and in the past year, uh, that's just a screenshot of the website. In the past year, um, we've uh, put these diary volumes online uh, with a transcription search that searches keyword across this whole diary collection. And, and of course, the collection has revealed many details about visiting London. So what do our diarists write about uh, in London? <coughs> Their days are certainly filled with a roll call of famous sites. They go to the Tower of London, Westminster Cathedral, St Paul's, the parks, the British Museum. All the sites are described in great detail. Often diarists seem to be quoting back to themselves the tour guides, facts and figures. Um, these colonial pilgrimages to famous sites in British history can, of course, be likened to the Grand Tour. It was a journey of the provincial to the metropolis, to the older civilisation. These visits seem uh, mainly educational and the diaries that were written often conform to the genre of travel diaries. Diaries written during the Grand Tour um, and they were posted home to interested family members to be read aloud in either Sydney or Bathurst or Dublin. Nights are spent at the theatre and the list of plays and musicals attended are varied, although Chu Chin Chow at His Majesty's was the most popular, along with the Bing Boys and the tube is regularly described and the novelty of escalators and the lifts at the stations are much commented on. Neither, of course, Sydney or Melbourne, the two largest Australian cities, had such facilities at that point. Once in London, the guidebooks provided information and structure to visiting colonials. This indicates that they, they're not English natives, they're not British, however much their own culture told them that. 
they were visitors and they needed guidance to get around. Um, one such book was The Colonial's Guide to London for Anzac Canadian and other overseas visitors, published in 1916 and again in 17 for all of those troops arriving on leave. Many of the recommendations included historic London sites and neighbourhoods, though apologetically admit, admits that um, the newly built, uh, rebuilt areas of towering blocks of flats and over-decorated mansions may have ruined the ambience of parts of it. I really liked page 168, which I've put there, which is a clear warning for overseas visitors. Do not talk up your own country because it's bad manners. Mm -hmm. It says, uh, we would advise our friends from overseas to refrain from comparisons which generally do not compare, and without budging from the very proper standpoint that their countries are the countries of the future, to remember always that Great Britain is a country with a very vital and illustrious past, their past no less than hers. And there was also a very um, specific instructions for uh, Australian uh, soldiers. Australians should always be smart and properly dressed, slouch hat turned up at side, putties and belt to be worn in public. Conduct yourself in a soldierly manner, be a credit to Australia. Pay strict attention to saluting. Officers should be careful to return all salutes in a smart and soldier-like manner also. On the termination of your leave, you are on your honour as an Australian soldier to parade at the time and place appointed for a training back to the depot. There were um, also a number of clubs specifically set up to host Australian troops on leave. Uh, established by voluntary organisations, these clubs were designed to be a home away from home. The War Chess Club was situated across the road from the administrative headquarters in Horse Ferry Road, and it provided meals and accommodation, an extraordinary capacity of 800 beds. Men uh, note in their diaries they went there for meals, to read the newspapers, to book a bed for the night. They wrote their letters home from there, uh, where writing materials were provided free. They took part in tour groups which left from the club, arranged and conducted by ladies who, who volunteered at the club. Another uh, club was uh, the Anzac Buffet, originally established in 1915, which provided free meals and entertainment to Australian <coughs> servicemen. It had also originally been uh, located on Horse Ferry Road, but in 1916 it was relocated to Victoria Road. The buffet was open seven days a week and the staff at the buffet uh, generally fed and entertained a thousand Australian servicemen a day. In addition to serving meals, the Anzac Buffet had billiard, reading and music rooms. Uh, a signaller, Ellis Silas, had been medically evacuated off Gallipoli and he eventually made his way to London in 1916 and he frequented the buffet. He was a civilian, in, uh, he was an artist in civilian life, and he painted uh, a rather lovely watercolour scene uh, of the interior of the buffet. And he wrote the buffet was a home away from home. Um, he writes rather fl flowery language. Thousands of miles of heaving ocean separate us from the homeland. It seems eons since we left the sunny coasts of Australia, and now we find ourselves dumped into the murk and gloom of war-ridden London. But the doors of the buffet open, and so after a long period, we're enabled to once more get in touch with matters Australian. On coming upon the Anzac buffet, we push open the door and look in, and lo, London is forgotten, for there around us are Australian faces, women folk from our own shores, the red cover of the good old bulletin and other Australian papers blink back at us. There is uh, Ellis Silas there striking a pose. Um, Ellis's, uh, Ellis Silas's patriotic feelings for Australia are curious in that he originally was a Londoner. His mother still lived in West Kensington. He sailed for Australia in 1907 at the age of 22 and uh, had been living in Perth for seven years uh, before he enlisted. Uh, Silas is certainly one of these Australian servicemen who, even though from London, now saw himself as an Australian, far away from home and relishing the Anzac buffet as a refuge in London. Uh, they were certainly uh, a long way from home. Uh, Edward Gillette, an orchardist from Western Australia, was 42 years old when he enlisted. And he f at first he finds London the hub of the universe. The very best of everything is here. But he also found it bewildering. A bigger fool than myself at finding his way about it would be hard to find. I was forever doing something idiotic and stupid. The Underground Railway had me fairly beaten. And he writes in great detail about uh, missing his stop on the tube because he can't locate the station sign amidst all the advertising signs and he just keeps going round and round in the loops. 
Um, he's forever getting lost and he writes 58 on his hand so that he remembers the name of the bus he's supposed to catch back to his accommodation. He also has terrible trouble using the escalators and found the stepping off process decidedly challenging and he writes that he resolved to travel on these in a seated position. You could imagine them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The Anzacs were astonished to find that women were employed in all sorts of occupations during wartime, working of course in the place of men in many industries. Many diarists comment on the women bus conductors and those working in the tube stations because this was not the case back home in Australia. An impressed 24-year-old George Horan wrote back to his father, the girls of London are as expert at jumping on and off moving buses as our paper boys on trams. They just grab the rail with one hand. There's a swirl of skirts and they're on. Not at all concerned. Nobody takes any notice. The little bus girls, conductresses, short skirts, cocked hats and knee boots, <coughs> climb up and down the stairs with the agility of monkeys, punching tickets and directing passages and working up to 12 midnight. Girls do everything. They're to be seen in all classes of work, some with trousers and long coats, such as window cleaners, mill girls, carriage cleaners, farm girls, etc. Others with short <coughs> skirts and knee boots. They all look <coughs> so chic. I was in the land of dreams. <laughs> <laughs> Walter Gillette was shocked by the lack of chivalry on public transport. He writes, Aussies would never think of retaining a seat while a lady would be forced to stand. On more than one occasion, I, like many others, suffered by giving up my seat on a tram to a lady. The conductor would tell me that as no standing was allowed, I would have to get off the car and wait for the next one. Rather rough. The Aussies would always do what was the recognised habit in their own country. On more than one occasion, I've seen an Aussie catch hold of some well-dressed chap and yank him out of his seat by the scruff of his neck to allow a lady to sit down. The said lady protesting meanwhile that she does not want to sit down, but the Aussie would insist to the admiration and amusement of the other passengers. George um, Horan's letter to his father are full of observations of Londoners, from the policeman who dispense all sorts of advice and information, to the listening of musicals attended, to the fog that crept into the streets and the dark city vulnerable to veteran, uh, Zeppelin attacks. Um, he writes, the London police are a splendid body of men, great six-footers, good-natured, possessed of a wealth of knowledge, and nothing is too much trouble for them in helping a stranger. While directing a continual flood of traffic, they are telling you exactly what to do to reach your destination. They take such a fatherly interest in you. Darkness is a theme of many diarists describing London at night and the extraordinary sight of the zeppelins in the skies. Although even the sighting of an aeroplane flying over the city attracted lots of attention, according to one diarist. Uh, George Horan reported, uh, London was never very bright at night and the lights were subdued or out entirely owing to the danger of the Zeps. All windows of lighted rooms had to be shaded, also of trains, trams and buses, and the no shouting order was rigidly adhered to. All street corners, pavements are painted white and also all pillar boxes, lampposts and other obstructions likely to be thumped in the darkness. Thomas Crooks, visiting in September 1916, wrote about the Zeppelin attacks. City almost in darkness. Uh, city almost in darkness. About 10.15 p.m., one of the searchlights picked up a large airship. It looked very uncanny gliding through space at such great height. It looked like silver in the rays of the searchlight. Anti-aircraft guns soon got to work and shells were seen to explode near her. The streets were crowded with excited women and children. About 1.30 a.m. there was a burst of flame high up in the air, away over near Woolwich. One of our aeroplanes had flown over her and destroyed her. There was mad cheering from the people as she came down. It was a grand sight. Nurse Anne Donnell uh, visited London a number of times, and um, in 1917 she described the food shortages and the community efforts of growing vegetables. She writes, The ground is pegged out in small squares, and there are women, old men and children digging the soil. Wherever you go out in London, you see the ground being tilled and planted by them. I suppose chiefly with potatoes. The food controller is doing his best to prevent a bread famine ere the next harvest is ready, and I think almost everyone is conscientiously doing their bit to help. It seems strange to have all you eat wait out uh, before it's given to you. Beans, rice, fish and <coughs> eggs are being used a great deal and are very good substitutes. She went on to write, while there, sitting in a park, a well-dressed and well-nourished Englishman came in and sat down near me. He became fearfully indignant and abused the government when he discovered it was a meatless day and he didn't like fish. Finally, he has two eggs. 
He vows this food question is absurd and unnecessary and says it is just like the English to follow blindly the leaders of the government without question. Then he's saying he wanted another cup of tea and felt like a naughty child when he humbly asked, couldn't he have a little lump of sugar for it? Then he grumbled again and said that it is the fault with the England. It treats you like babies and expects you to fight like lions. With amusement at his size, I asked him if he found his portion of foodstuff sufficient. It was a needless question. His reply was that what he couldn't get at one shop, he got at another. So these accounts uh, were written by, by Australians as outsiders. They were observers who looked on London and inevitably compared it uh, with their actual home. Uh, Jim Marshall, with his critical eye and his penchant for minutely comparing London to his hometown of Sydney, concluded that while he had had an interesting visit, it was not his home. Summing up now. <laughs> um, Jim wrote, well, I've spent an interesting four days, and though I was not exactly disappointed, London did not come up to my expectations. I had thought I would be very excited on reaching the chief city of the world, but after Sydney, which has made such strides and has all that is modern, and some fine examples of all the leading forms of architecture, that London did not seem anything extra special at all. Though there is none like St Paul's, the Abbey, or the Houses of Parliament with their old associations, etc., Sydney has her blue, sunny sky always, not the perpetual haze of smoke above her, as has London, as well as the abominable, frequent London fogs. Lastly, Sydney has her unequaled position on the harbour, and I'm a native of Sydney, and so I suppose I must be a bit biased, though I have made, I think, a very fair comparison. <laughs> They were soldier tourists, of course, on an accidental grand tour, finding refuge in sightseeing away from the horror of the trenches. There, they were involved, they were in the thick of it, and London was a respite, a chance to be detached from surroundings, which perhaps made them keep going, kept them sane, and allowed them to return to France and the trenches. And of course, it would be another 50 years before the tradition of the European trip and the obligatory tours of London uh, would again be brought within the reach of, of average Australians in the age of jet travel. This war foreshadowed um, the current age of democratic tourism. And I'll end with Archie, who is departing London back to the front line, where he wrote, one of the <coughs> finest cities of the world. I shall never, never forget the time I had there. The kindness of the people, the pretty girls, the taxis, the plays, and the roar of old London. It will sound in my ears for years to come, and I shall always look back on it with pleasure. At 10 minutes to 8 this morning, we left her for good, for our lead was up, and we were returning to what? I'm glad you enjoyed Lisa's paper, because mine is sort of a similar thing, but moving to New Zealand rather than Australia. Um, so, let's so open the quote. I used to narc my father because on two occasions when I was away, I sent a cable grab home to my mother. Forward me £20. I was told afterwards my father went mad. What's he doing over there with this £20? But I was seeing the world and I thought, if I live, I'll never get to see it again. So I might as well see what I can while I'm here. New Zealander Leslie Sargent expressed the confusing blurring between his role as a soldier and his performative tourism. Sent overseas to fight, he took the opportunity to explore places that he'd never been to and didn't imagine he'd ever see again. Though debates surrounding Richard White's soldier as tourist analogy have challenged the role of tourism in the lives of the serving troops, this paper argues that the experience of soldiering and tourism did intersect within the specific circumstances of war. Though not the sole function of enlisting, tourism was a key feature of the, account of the accounts investigated in my research and something at last that was understandable for families reading letters at home. In this paper, I look at the experience of New Zealand troops, Bill Massey's tourists in London, one of the prime destinations for leave once they moved to the Western Front, with approximately 60,000 New Zealand troops passing through the capital. London, the imperial metropolis, ancient city of historic significance, seat of majesty and governance, and center of tourism and leisure, had a great deal to offer the visiting soldier. It was, though, of special significance for the White Dominion troops, as Elisa's paper is showing. Felicity Barnes's work on New Zealand's London has revealed how the metropolis was constructed and appropriated by New Zealanders during this period and beyond to minimise the colony's peripheral status, bridging the gap between empire and dominion, creating a form of cultural co-ownership in both New Zealand's cultural imagination and in the actual appropriation of London's space 
as with the influx of soldiers during the First World War. New Zealanders, tall young men in khaki, with queer bunched up hats with a line of red in their khaki poogery, lie in the Strand, as articulated in the Times on the 29th of January 1917. No one knew who they were at first, but they are now a familiar part of the scene. This paper considers the experience of New Zealanders in London as represented in their own words, and how far they looked for and felt at home in the imperial metropolis. What expectations did the men have? How did guidebooks form plans and intentions? Drawing on both Pakaha and Māori accounts, I will discuss how the men wrote about their time in the metropolis, considering the subversion of the official guide and tracing the experience of the sexual life of the metropolis as part of the New Zealanders' attempts to look for home. It's difficult to trace what shaped the men's expectations of London. They most frequently wrote home during or at the end of their stay, describing the big smoke or the big city, rather than in anticipation of it. The familiarity infused in their written accounts of the places they see and the occasional mention of photographs seen before suggest the metropolis's presence in the New Zealand press and popular culture, as well as the familial ties between mother country and dominion. They may have also been more directly influenced by other soldiers returning from leave or hostile stays in England. E.M. Ryburn wrote on the 6th of August 1915 that he received another sad blow. Jock McQueen, of all people, arrived back. He was wounded in the fatal 2nd of May advance, bomb wounds in the throat, and ever since has been having all sorts of a time in England, England, mind you. He made me frightfully envious with his tales of sightseeing, being entertained by titles, etc., and he said a, co a colonial simply couldn't help having a good time. It rose up and hit one. McQueen clearly whetted Ryburn's appetite and jealousy for visiting London when on leave. It was a combination of seeing England, mind you, the mother country, and the all-encompassing good time that would be had. The poem Leave in New Zealand at the Front in 1917 is a bit more specific about what it's all the hopes for in London. It includes the following verse. I long for Piccadilly and its crowds of lovely girls with their neat silk stocking gown claws and their captivating curls, with their thin delicious blouses, dreams of silk and filmy net, are pink 90s now the fashion, or is it crap short <laughs> Going on leave in London, and particularly Piccadilly, is envisioned as a time and a space for sexual contact of a strictly heterosexual nature. Piccadilly, in London's West End, was in the heart of the metropolis, a centre for imperial power and government, as well as leisure and vice. The poet doesn't indicate that these women are prostitutes. Their grouped presence in the city seems more related to its attractions of entertainment and leisure. The poem's description of these numerous women, these crowds of lovely girls, also fits into the discourse surrounding Parkin fever as discussed by Angela Woolacott, the attraction to men in uniform, which could render collective female behaviour immodest and even dangerous. In its publication in the Troop magazine, the poem would share the poet's ex expectation of sex on leave for those men who read it. How far this was actually experienced will be explored. The colonial's expectations of having... Of Exploring the sites and having a good time could also be managed by the mass production of official guidebooks. <coughs> You're going to have the Colonial's Guide to London. Um, so the Colonial's Guide to London was published in 1917, designated for overseas visitors, Anzacs, Canadians, and all other soldiers of the empire, though it does assume that most of its readers are white. Um, as James Corrin's work on soldiers in Paris has illuminated, though the guidebook may have compounded the anxiety of being able to see everything, it was also indispensable in the advice it offered. They were objective, informative, and compact, agents of directing gazes and prompting responses. The Colonial's Guide marked out a particular version of London for the visiting soldiers. It had information on sites, excursions, itineraries, as well as tips and don'ts, were de designed to make the visiting soldier at home in the city, within the bounds of its mapped version of London. Because it's a very specific space that the guide considers as its London for the visiting troop. It directed them on their quest for authenticity towards the Tower of London, Westminster Abbey, St Paul's, encouraging a, share, a sense of shared history and being at home through these sites. Its author, A. Staines Manders, is clear that it is old London that the overseas visitor most desires to know and understand. These sites appeal to the imagination of the peoples of the Dominions as no novelty, however brilliant, can appeal. For these are theirs and ours, and in the shadow of the Abbey or the White Tower, we are Londoners all. Brief references to organised visits to more exotic quarters of the city, like Limehouse or Petticoat Lane, would allow the visiting troops, presumed to be white, to feel at home by gazing upon 
all waste foreign quarters as New Zealander Egbert Dredge deemed them. The guide's provision of walking guides and itineraries gave the soldiers clear interpretations and meanings to take from their exploration of the city, an interesting symbiosis of the imagined and realised spaces. So you're reading what the guide wants you to see while you're in the space that it's describing. It also attempts a certain amount of control over both the spaces the soldiers should occupy and their time in London. Directions to specific areas of the city are given and the guide highlights the meanings that should be taken from each street. It also includes when is enough for one day, keeping the soldier completely occupied in a similar effort to the guided tours offered by the YMCA or the New Zealand War Contingent Association. As described in the Times, the NZWCA was directed towards keeping the men in a healthy and cheerful atmosphere. This could, as Bonnet has concluded, prescribe the soldiers' access to disreputable London, as well as reinforcing this version of London that existed in the peripheral imagination. There is also the potential that this version of London could be mapped over and subverted by the visiting troops. And it also instructs the guards for soldiers on how to behave, so it's tips on tipping and prices, so they don't get ripped off by the people who know that they could get paid more than all the other troops, um, as well as pickpockets and policemen. It advises, as Elise, Elise highlighted, not to talk too vigorously about New Zealand and refrain from making comparisons. But these kind of acts are a reminder to the visiting colonials to remember their place within the empire, that Britain is the mother country and the reason that they're all there, particularly during this time of war. It's clear that these mappings of the city presented in the guide like this aiming to create an authentic and knowable London, form the basis of many of the expeditions for the New Zealand soldiers. The historic depth of the capital that Adrian Graham was talking about this morning and its role in the psyche of the national, uh, or its role in the national psyche is true of the colonial psyche as well. The historic sites are the focus of the itineraries of many of the troops as represented in their letters and diaries and also in their snapshot albums, it's not a very good picture, um, it's the House of Parliament, Westminster Abbey, and Trafalgar Square. So these are the pictures that soldiers are choosing to take and to, to bring home with them. Though often recounted in a brief list, indicating familiarity, in witnessing the historic sites and traditions, many had an authentic experience of the city. Reginald Donald simply wrote, 8, 9, 10, 11th August 1917 was spent in London, seeing the sites, museums, changing of guards, Whitehall, Houses of Parliament, Lords and Commons, <coughs> Westminster Abbey, St Paul's, London Tower Bridge and Guildhall. All worth seeing and very interesting. <laughs> Similarly, Albert Bosfield had a look around and had seen most of the principal sites. House of Parliament, Westminster Abbey, Tower of London, King's Stables, Buckingham Palace, Waxworks and Zoo. There is great admiration for the beauty of the buildings like the Abbey or St Paul's, whose historic significance could be taken as symbols of the empire the men were ostensibly fighting for. They also make use of the guided tours to enable this sightseeing. Harry O'Donnell Burke was happy to pay the four shillings a head that it cost for their lady guide, presumably a uniformed volunteer, um, as it was well worth it. As John McGuire highlighted in his diary, these were the sites they wanted to see, the places of principal importance. It was their innings in London, to use Private Gray's phrase, and they were there to see it sites in their limited time of freedom away from the war. While not necessarily at home, they had seen enough to satisfy their expectations of the big smoke's main sites. In contrast, E.M. Ryburn of the Otago Regiment seems unsatisfied with these traditional sites in his three visits to London. On his first visit on the 21st of June 1916, he ticked off all the same sites, all sorts of things so well known by name to us, as he described. Yet he found that these places lose a lot of their romantic interest, I think you could call it, by seeming to fit so naturally into their surroundings. I found this strike me with regards to all the so-called sites. Similarly, in his account of his second visit on the 5th of October 1916, though it would have been criminal to have missed seeing Westminster Abbey, he found the space inside claustrophobic and unfulfilling. Going to Madame Tussauds later in the month, another way of recapturing London and Britain's historic past, he found it quite a fraud. The experience wasn't authentic. There is an air of discontent in his account the reality of the landmarks so well known <coughs> as isolated landmarks and photographs and postcards come together in a way that disillusions. Familiarity, it seems, breeds contempt. Interestingly, when Ryburn stopped looking for authentic London and started looking for home for New Zealand, his experience seems to have been much more satisfying. On the 31st of October 1916, he and some pals went to the museums in South Kensington, but didn't have much joy with the exhibitions at the Natural History Museum. 
gave it up in the end, and I asked one of the numerous bobbies about if they had any Australasian exhibit exhibits, seeing they didn't go in for stuffed animals, etc., and he directed us to the Imperial Institute not far away. I wanted to see a bit of NZ. We found the Institute and found there were exhibits from all of the different colonies, made our way to Australasia, and found that the NZ exhibit was humiliatingly small. <laughs> However, there was any amount of interest in what was there, and we filled in the morning. Coming to the exhibition allowed him to feel at home in a way that the historic, culturally co-owned sites of London had not, despite being upset by the humiliating small place his home had held in the Institute undermining the sense of connection he felt existed between metropolis and colony, he and his pals were able to spend the whole morning there. Though the museums had featured on official maps and guides, Brybrand and his friends subverted the intention of exploring London to trace elements of their homes and the sites they saw. The subtle overmapping and overlapping intentions in the sites explored is continued in a different way in the published account of Rikihana Karki of the Mary Parian <coughs> Battalion. Carkeep followed many of the instructions. He went straight to the New Zealand War Contingents Association on his arrival in August 1988, <coughs> and he stayed in the New Zealand Soldiers Club here in Russell Square. He similarly ticked off the sites, predominantly restricting his exploration of London to those areas that were designated as belonging to New Zealanders too. But within Carkeep's account, encounters with women begin to be entwined with these activities. He writes of women paying for their tea and meals when at Madame Tussauds and somewhere on the Strand. And unfortunately, he doesn't include, he doesn't indicate their age or their class, but they weren't at work and they weren't in uniform. This provision for visiting soldiers could be read as an extension of the domestic and the patriotic, but it is an interesting dynamic of women treating men, to use the language of amateur prostitution, linking sex and maternal care. Carkeek's account begins to introduce women into the representation of London, as well as serving as an example of how Maori soldiers could participate as fully in the exploration of London as the visiting white troops. Ryburn and Carkey show that in following the official guides, going to museums or visiting Madame Tussauds, they were able to have encounters that belied the official intention. Other leisure activities that form part of the tourist agenda could similarly have multiple meanings. I'm going to focus on the theatre, a site for leisure and pleasure seeking, which was also featured as official sightseeing. London's theatres, located then as now on the West End, brought centres of entertainment within the same space as centres of national importance, one of the frequent contradictions of the space of the metropolis, and as already raised in the prime leave. The West End was also connected with prostitution, a space where an array of commercial and sexual pleasures were available. The theatres themselves had associations with prostitution, and the actresses on the stage were subject to the male gaze, personas of visual pleasure and sexual availability. By visiting the theatre, the soldiers could both tick off one of the authentic London experiences and see the boundary between reputable and disreputable begin to blur. For some, it was straightforward. Wyvern feels at home with the other men in khaki at the Empire saying, follow the crowd, just the same as an NZ audience. And Eric Haynes wrapped up his rapid sightseeing tour at Davies Theatre. I loved it, though we stood all the way through at the side below the gallery. They let us do that because we were soldiers. For Herbert Hart and Herbert Tuck, though, the theatre is a space where women and sexual pleasure become more entwined with leisure. Hart observed that London is very crowded and very, very wicked. I have never seen so many totties before, well-dressed and looking radiant. <laughs> Herbert Tuck brought a nice little girl with him to the theatre, a different one from last night. Mm -hmm. Oh, I can tell you, I'm getting no better fast. The theatre and its surrounds were there when the metropolis is wickedness and vice becomes apparent. It was also a place we could bring a girl whom you could sit next to in the dark and be entertained, hidden within the crowd. Other similar spaces might be parks, and Maori soldier Karki also rode back out to Hyde Park one evening to meet a lady friend, a further example of the unofficial pleasures and how these went hand in hand with more traditional sites. It should be noted that along with streets, cinemas, music halls and dancing halls, theatres and parks were considered within the bounds of the patrols of the women's police forces in the period, aiming to uphold moral principles and preventing sexual liaisons between local women and the troops, as shown in the work of Angela Willicott and Chronicle of Levine. Though the women were policed, these New Zealand troops had the full freedom of the city and its spaces, accessing public spaces where more private acts could happen. Unfortunately, the men do not explicitly detail their sexual encounters more than meeting a nice girl or a lady friend. Homosexual relationships or codes are also absent. Prostitution is visible in the accounts, for Hart it was part of London's wickedness, and Francis Healy's dislike of London 
arose from the way the women drink in the public bars and the amount of prostitution on the streets both day and night. The way it is written about creates not only the gaze of the tourist, but an imperial gaze turned back on the metropolis, similar to how the wazir in Cairo was described. And New Zealanders like Hart and Healy could experience a form of metropolitan superiority, which went further than just examining London's exotic periphery. Sex, though, was an expected part of leave. Eric Haynes has expressed his shock that before leaving London they were issued with contraceptives and antiseptic ointments in the hope of reducing venereal diseases. The great majority of us, I am sure, had never heard of such a practice, being unsophisticated in an unsophisticated era, and we had received our initiation with a sort of wild incredulity. John A. Lee's novel, Civilian into Soldier, based on his own experiences of going into war, perhaps allows the subject of sex on leave to be more fully explored as a fictional representation, rather than a letter or diary read by one's nearest and dearest. Lee's narrator associated sex on leave in London with a domestic and home. Sex, like drink or tobacco, drugged the senses for a moment, but according to Lee, it also separated the soldiers from home. New Zealand women belong to a departed world where soldiers have been fathers and husbands and brothers and sons. Lee's protagonist engages in sex only when on leave in London because there is something specific about the English women that allows this relationship with home to be maintained. Their presence, their attractiveness, their Anglo-Saxon characteristics, their pure English, catered for something in the soldier that had been stifled, a something for which the sight and sound of a French slattern was a poor substitute. There was a touch of home, of New Zealand, about the club in the heart of empire, and reactions of a subtle nature were evoked. On leave in London, the protagonist ends up entangled in a relationship with an Englishwoman, positioned as something of an amateur, where for a few days they play out family life as well as fulfilling their <coughs> sexual needs. London's women are culturally co-opted in the same way that some of the sites are. The particular connection of New Zealand to its metropolis, a dominion set up by immigrants from the mother country, created familiarity between the peoples. Rather than the professional prostitute that the French slattern was, there was more of a connection to English women who could still be nice girls while providing sexual encounters. There could then be a domestication of sex in London for the New Zealanders. Their domestic or maternal needs were often fulfilled by the soldiers' clubs that they stayed in, run by women who mothered and looked after the soldiers on leave, but in an official capacity with clearly professionalised bounds, similarly to the to the to prevent Christina's paper, providing a home away from home for these soldiers. Equally, London's female population outside of these official <coughs> organisations fulfil the same purpose along with other needs that were less regulated and less reputable. There is then a complicated picture of the emotional experience and relationship that the visiting New Zealanders construct with the metropolis. As Barnes has argued, there was a great deal of cultural friendship, and many of the New Zealanders expressed familiarity and satisfaction with London's historic sites at finally seeing the big smoke. The sites of places and streets that soldiers write about would also be familiar to the families reading at home. Similarly, in some of their engagement with women, there was a feeling of being at home, of something familiar and domestic about London. However, there's also a quest to find New Zealand itself within the sites, as in Ryburn's trip to the Imperial Institute. Alongside this, the New Zealanders turn, turned a form of imperial gaze onto London's vice, specifically prostitution and women's behaviour, that enabled them to assort, assert a level of superiority over the metropolis, which created a distinct sense of New Zealand identity, rather than just being at home in London. Uh, I'll start off by saying I've got a cold, so if I keel ke over, uh, it's because of that and uh, nothing else. Um, the principal aim of this paper is to explore whether the military contribution of black African and Caribbean servicemen from brawling the British colonies in the World War I was accorded the same status as the service of white British, white Dominion and white Commonwealth forces in commemoration of remembrance practice in the immediate aftermath of the war. If it wasn't, then this has repercussions for the memory of that service in the present day. I find African and Caribbeans worthy of study because during the war a strenuous effort was made by the British military and governmental authorities to exclude black British, African and Caribbean servicemen from serving on the Western Front. This policy conformed to a pre-war strategy designed by the Colonial Defence Committee and its successor, the Committee for Imperial Defence. Uh, a memo from 1902 outlines the policy. A. The main burden of a great struggle between the British Empire and one or more states of European race or descent must be borne by the white subjects of the king 
and B, military contingents, therefore, of any of other than men of European descent need not be considered with regard to this particular problem. Although the great value of the Indian Army and the usefulness of the African and other native forces are fully recognised. We know that despite these principles, a form of colour bar, some blacks did manage to bypass military authorities and enlist in a variety of British regiments, and that eventually, for political reasons, Caribbeans and coloured South Africans were officially permitted to serve in the Allied Army in the European theatre, but on a non combatant basis and only for the duration of hostilities. Outside of Europe, Africans and Caribbeans were allowed a combat role against other African Ascari in German colonial forces in Western East Africa. In Mesopotamia, Caribbeans were allowed a minor combat role against ethnically Asian forces from the Ottoman Empire. In both Africa and Mesopotamia, the condition under which blacks were allowed to fight was that they had to be under the leadership of white officers and white non-commissioned officers. Their deployment against Africans and Asians betrays race thinking by military officials. In the controlled deployment of Africans and Caribbeans in Europe and other theatres, it can be seen that the deployment conformed to the War Office notion of a white man's war between the European imperial powers, but it was also prefigured on a belief that if blacks were allowed to fight alongside whites, it could lead to a lowering of white prestige in Britain and the colonies of the British Empire. I will try to demonstrate using a cultural approach and by using national government and local London archives that decision by military governments and colonial officials regarding the commemoration of African and Caribbean <coughs> service in the aftermath of the war was entrenched in the prevailing attitudes of race, class and gender of the time. Put simply, having constructed differences between so-called races, some races thought that they were more advanced than others and came to see the defence of their race or their whiteness as their life's work. Such attitudes emanated as much from the colonies as within Britain, so it makes sense to investigate the memory of black service in the First World War by placing metropolitan colony within a single analytical framework. I will use the spaces and place of London as a focus uh, for the investigation to the memory and remembrance of African and Caribbean participation in the war, as the capital has been variously described as the imperial centre, the capital city of empire, the port of empire, and the headquarters of 375 million coloured people. In the aftermath of the war, it also became the symbolic memorial focus of the British Empire. I will hope to demonstrate official racialised thinking in three studies. The Peace Parade of 19th of July 1919, the Million Dead of Empire tablet in Westminster Abbey, and the Tower Hill Memorial unveiled in 1928 all of which cause problems for how we remember the black colonial's uh, service in the present day. In February 1919, two months after the signing of the armistice, the War Cabinet in London appointed a Peace Celebrations Committee to organise official celebrations for the end of the war. They invited suggestions from other government departments and the military on how peace should be celebrated, not just in Britain but throughout the empire. The committee was chaired by Lord Curzon, the Foreign Secretary, and comprised of representatives from the Army, Navy, Home Office, Colonial Office, Dominions Office, and the Board of Works. In this way, there would be representation from all the armed services and all parts of Empire in shaping the form and content of peace celebrations. Their first decision was to hold four days of celebration in London. According to Cabinet Office papers, the committee convened in April 1919 to discuss colonial participation in the proposed peace celebrations. The minutes showed that officials expressed surprise that they had been asked to give an opinion at all. They imagined the celebrations to be a purely domestic affair, or that the might dominions might be involved in some way. Gilbert Grindle, the Assistant Undersecretary of State for the Colonies, went as far as to say that the Colonial Office had no suggestions to make beyond requesting to know the date of the celebration so that they could inform the overseas colonies who would then be expected to organise their own celebrations. The suggestion of a domestic affair might connote a parochial view that the celebration should not be of an imperial character, but a national one. The suggestions, however, that the Dominions might participate suggest that officials conceive the proposed parade in both hierarchical and racial terms, with a desire to see only white troops, British and Dominion, and black colonial troops excluded. In their refusal to contemplate the participation of black colonial forces in the proposed London parade, officials were turning their face against what Eric Hobsbawm would call an invented tradition <coughs> of celebrations in London in which black soldiers had previously been invited, such as Queen Victoria's Diamond Jubilee in 1897, the coronation procession of Edward VII in 1902. The exception to this tradition was the coronation procession of George V in 1911, when African and Caribbean colonies were not invited to attend. It has been suggested that this was because English women had lavished so much attention 
on black soldiers during Edward VII's coronation. It is, uh, the exclusion also demonstrated the contingent nature of, war, of ceremonials. Whatever the reason for the 1911 exclusion, colonial and war office officials would have known about the importance of cultural precedent in establishing the form and content of state ceremonials and spectacles. African and Caribbean troops were an integral part of the protection <coughs> of imperial reach and might. <coughs> in previous ceremonials, such as jubilees mm -hmm. and coronations, and during the war, the participation of black colonial troops had provided a morale boost to the civilian population, as attested by the favourable reception given to the British West Indies <coughs> when they marched as part of the Lord Mayor's Show in London in 1915. Colonial officials in 1919, however, concluded their discussion by stating that not even representatives of colonies should be invited to London. In April 1919, in the House of Lords, Lord Denman, the former Governor General of Australia, had asked whether there would be a march through London of Dominion and colonial troops. His question was echoed by Viscount Harcourt, the former Colonial Secretary, who argued that any triumphal march must include coloured troops from the West Indies as a tribute to the sacrifices that they had made. He also stated that the memory of <coughs> East and West African troops should be represented if possible. Viscount Peel, representing the government, replied that it had been decided that there would be a march of overseas troops through London. However, he then explained that, <coughs> quote, the word overseas troops has a rather wide application, unquote. Peel's obfuscating use of the term overseas troops appears to refer to a march of Dominion forces only, and his code response suggested that black colonial forces would not be included in any march uh, through London. Indeed, on the 3rd of May 1919, 12,000 Dominion forces from Australia, Canada, New Zealand, Newfoundland and South Africa did march through London. The military procession was accorded the highest status and was attended by the King and Queen. Discussion of the reasons for holding the march are not in the archive, but there appears to have been political pressure at the highest governmental levels outside the colonial office to include Dominion forces in a military parade as a sign of gratitude before they were demobilised. The support of the Dominions, politically, militarily and economically, had contributed to British victory in the war, and their status in the imperial hierarchy increased proportionately, but not enough to be in the proposed victory parade later that year. There appears to be no such mobilisation of effort to include colonial forces in the parade. The issue of race and hierarchy was clearly at the height uh, at the heart of decision making, and suggest the government were both nervous to explain their uh, suggest the government were nervous to explain their policy publicly, but determined to be seen to reward white Dominion service than not black colonial service. The peace celebrations committee was due to meet again on the 9th of May, six days after the march of the Dominion forces. Earlier that day, colonial officials had met to clarify their position <coughs> on the yet unresolved issue of black colonial involvement in the celebrations. An official named Darnley proposed that a small detachment of volunteers from the British West Indies Regiment might remain in London before they were demobilised to take the King's salute. Uh, Major Beattie, who had served in the West Africa Frontier Force, uh, stated that he hoped a detachment of both the West Africa Frontier Force and the King's African Rifles <coughs> would be allowed to take part in the celebrations. He added that he was, quote, fully aware of the objections that there are to bringing African native troops to this country, unquote. He explained, nevertheless, his belief that African native troops could be brought to Britain for the proposed ceremonial. At this point in the discussion, Sir Gilbert Grindle made a decisive intervention. He argued, if contingents of coloured colonial forces were available, I would suggest including them. But one, in view of recent experiences, and two, in view of the objections of having coloured men stationed in this country, it seems going out of our way to invite trouble to bring them over here for the function. Grindle was supported in his argument by Sir Henry Lambert, who contended it was absurd that, quote, when we are straining every nerve to get men repatriated, to bring people here for show purposes, for show purposes. The Dominions have had their march here, and the proper place to celebrate pieces of home, wherever home may be, unquote. He then went on to express his desire that the proposal should be strenuously resisted. Another official agreed with these sentiments and added, we shall be inviting trouble if we attempt to arrange for coloured detachments in our recent experience, unquote. Why were colonial officials so determined to prevent black colonial forces from attending the peace celebrations? The colonial office uh, had just received a handful of letters complaining about the continued presence of coloured troops. Uh, Grindle's reference to, quote, objections to having coloured men stationed in this country, unquote, might be referring to the colonial war office policy of keeping black troops spatially distant from white soldiers in the European theatre. The references to recent experiences 
and the government straining every nerve to get them repatriated, most likely relate to the authorities' efforts to repatriate African and Caribbean seamen caught up in race riots in Britain and soldiers of the British West Indies Regiment had mutinied at their base in Toronto in December 1918. The policy for re repatriation, re-deportation, of coloured men and women was the main response of the British government to a series of race riots which occurred in towns such as Glasgow, South Shields, East London, Liverpool and Cardiff from January to August 1919. Contrary to evidence, police reports at the time blamed coloured seamen for the violence, especially those acting in self-defence. The government accepted their conclusion and moved quickly to deport as many African seamen as possible. A Home Office official in June 1919 suggested, quote, while it is not possible to deport compulsorily any coloured men who are British subjects, all coloured men should be induced to return to their own countries as quickly as possible, unquote. Black seamen from Africa, Aden and the Caribbean who had served loyally and in great danger during the war found themselves not hailed as heroes but stereotyped as troublemakers. Viscount Milner, the colonial secretary, wrote, quote, I am seriously concerned that there continued disturbances due to racial ill feeling against coloured men in our large seaports. These riots are serious enough from the point of view of the maintenance of order in this country, but they are even more serious in regard to their possible effect in the colonies. I have every reason to fear that when these men get back to their own colonies, they might be tempted to revenge themselves on the white minorities there. Unless we can do something to show His Majesty's Government it is not insensible to their complaints. I am convinced that if we wish to get rid of the coloured population whose presence is causing so much trouble, we must pay the expense of doing so ourselves. It will not be great." Unquote. Meanwhile, a journalist uh, 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 attacked the idea of loyal black Britons uh, or, or the protestations of loyalty from the seamen. He wrote, quote, The Negro is almost pathetically loyal to the British Empire and is always proud to proclaim himself a Briton, unquote, so equating Britishness with whiteness. A new act, the 1919 Aliens Restriction Amendment Act 1919, was brought in so the Home Secretary could deport any alien without appeal from the courts, and any alien could be refused entry to Britain at the discretion of an immigration officer. Such racialised thinking might explain the attitude expressed by Grindle uh, that to invite college attachments to any ceremony would be inviting trouble. Black colonial servicemen had been problematised by government and military officials without taking into consideration the racial antagonism that they faced or the legitimacy of their actions. Later on that day, the colonial office representatives on the peace celebration committee, Sir Harry Batterby, conveyed the message to the full committee that in their opinion, their opinion, neither colonial nor dominion foot troops, as the latter had marched already, need be invited to participate in the proposed peace day celebrations in London. The full the committee did discuss the imperial collection, uh, complexion of the proposed parade. Lord Curzon noted that although representatives of the Dominions wished to attend, he still hoped that the parade would be domestic in character. He added that celebrations in this country should be restricted to our own people. The colonial office, uh, sorry, the colonial officials said nothing as a representative of the army, Charles supported Curzon's view that the military parade should be of domestic character, but he suggested with our own troops and Dominion troops. When the Peace Celebration Committee next met on the 1st of July 1919, hostilities had been formally ended by the signing of the Treaty of Versailles. The committee's plans for four days of celebrations were scrapped and they decided that the peace celebration should be confined to just one day, Saturday the 19th of July, heightening the importance of the Victory March as the main focus of the day. American forces were in London on that date and Lord Curzon felt that they should be part of the march alongside Britain's allies. The suggested inclusion of American troops forced a reaction at last from Batterby of the Colonial Office. He suggested that the Dominions would resent the participation of American forces if Imperial forces were not included. Curzon demanded, uh, sorry, determined that the character of the march should be national and not Imperial, replied that the Dominion forces had already had a procession and that there was no Dominion forces left in the country. He did not refer to the colonies. Cabinet Office papers revealed a change of mind on the participation of Dominion and also Indian troops in early July. The new view may have been influenced by information coming from France, which described the forthcoming Paris Victory March. French colonial troops from North and West Africa were to be a prominent feature of the Paris Parade. In fact, at the Paris Victory March on the 14th of July 1919, a 1,098-strong British contingent <coughs> included a small detachment of Australia, <coughs> New Zealand, and South African Dominion forces, numbering 35 in total. 
The records also show that an Indian contingent set, uh, that had an Indian contingent set sail earlier, they too were reserved a place in the Paris March behind the South Africans in an imperial order of precedence. It has not been possible to ch trace the reasons for this change of mind, but the decision was taken speedily. The final meeting of the Peace Celebrations Committee on the 9th of July reflected a new mood to include Dominion and Indian forces in the London Peace Parade. Brigadier General Fielding expressed his hope that the procession would include Dominion forces. He believed that the Canadian and Newfoundland troops would be unable to participate, however. One of two troop ships of Indians was expected to make the parade after all. The final official programme for the 19th of July 1919 shows that the Americans and the Allies led off the parade. Can I have five minutes? Yeah, thank you. Um, um, led off the parade. Um, the French contingent, as in Paris a few days earlier, included one company of colonial infantry composed of Zouars and Tirailleurs from France's North and West African territories. There was representation from the Dominions in the form of 108 Australians, 36 New Zealanders, and 24 South Africans. The Times reported that, in fact, the small contingent of Canadians under General Curry did participate in the parade. The day before, one of, one of the troop ships with an Indian contingent had arrived in Britain, and the troops were speedily transported to London. So 260 Indians were, in fact, present on the procession. These hurried but determined efforts to include representatives of the Dominions in India reflect both a belated desire for imperial window dressing in the London ceremonial, but also a consistent determination to exclude colonial forces from the London parade. Uh, I'll just... Now, if we just move to the colonies, um, official correspondence between Nigeria and the colonial office show that some white officers felt uncomfortable about the exclusion of black colonial troops from the London parade. Lieutenant Colonel Godwin Coles, a serving officer in the Nigerian regiment of the West African Frontier Force, wrote to the government of Nigeria, uh, Sir Hugh Clifford, protesting against the exclusion of Africans. He felt that their service had been ignored and no reason given for their exclusion. The governor then wrote to Milner, who replied that short notice was the reason that African troops were not asked to participate in the procession. Within the papers, a minute by a colonial official reminded administrators of the 9th of May discussion where it was decided that it would be impolitic to bring to this country coloured detachments to participate in peace celebrations. Um, this decision did not go unnoticed in Africa and the Caribbean. Uh, many articles uh, were critical of, of the decision. Uh, one of them uh, wrote to a letter to the editor of West Africa in your issue published the week after the Victory March in London, you asserted that Africans could not be on the march because there was no time to get them to England owing to lack of transport. You mean to say that Great Britain could not afford to send two men of war to bring them if they had wanted. They were fit to assist in breaking the aggression of Germany, but they were not fit to be in the Victory March. We live and learn. Um, just to sort of move on really quickly, because I've only got oh, about three minutes left, uh, I'm just going to shoot on to the other area that I said I would study, and this is uh, Westminster Abbey. Now, in Britain in 1923, the Imperial War Graves Commission, uh, established to, to care for the war graves and memory of the dead and missing from across the British Empire, responded to requests from the Dominion governments for a greater acknowledgement of the sacrifices of their troops in the Great War. They commissioned a series of tablets dedicated to the dead of the British Empire to be erected in cathedrals throughout France and Belgium and in Westminster Abbey. The tablets were made up of the British coat of arms, which you can see there, surrounded by the coats of arms of India, Canada, Australia, Newfoundland, New Zealand, and South Africa. The Caribbean colonies were contributors to the commission and were asked for a contribution towards the cost of these tablets. However, they were not re represented on the tablets, and neither were Britain's African colonies. A tablet called The Million Dead of the British Empire was erected in the Warriors Chapel of Empire, now called St George's Chapel, in Westminster Abbey in 1926 in time for the Imperial Conference, which was held in London that year. An interesting exchange of letters about, uh, about this in late 1932 cast some light on the attitudes towards the tablet. An ex-sergeant of the 3rd Battalion British West Indies Regiment, T.A. Daly, wrote in his delight at seeing the efforts of the British Empire being commemorated in London and, Euro and Europe, but his disappointing, disappointment at not seeing the colonies of the Caribbean or the Caribbean represented on the tablet. He wanted the Caribbean colonies inscribed retrospectively on the tablet, and he wrote to the War Office and the West India Committee to request this. The issue was debated at the highest level, with Major General Sir Fabian Ware in correspondence with the Secretary of the West India Committee in London. 
Sir Algernon Aspinall, where it was acknowledged that the Imperial War Grace, by the Imperial War Grace Committee, that the Caribbean governments were contributors to the work of the Commission. Fabian Ware was upset at the accusation that the colonies did not acknowledge the good work that the Commission had carried out on behalf of the Caribbean, ensuring that all fallen members of the British West Indies Regiment had an individual headstone. Aspinall agreed to write back to Daly on Ware's behalf uh, with three reasons. One was that there was no room to put colonies on the tablet. Two, Britain had a special relationship with the Dominions. And three, all colonies were represented on the tablet by the British coat of arms. Uh, <laughs> Daly wrote back to Aspinall, and this is the end of his letter. He said, the fact as I see it is simply this. Uh, on a war memorial, supposedly a tribute to all those of the British Empire who fell during the war, only the Dominions are mentioned. No mention whatever is made of the loyal colonies as if they do not constitute a part of the British Empire. No stranger to the facts can be expected to see in these memorials that the British West Indies and other colonies played any part in the war, nor could any future generations reading the fact be expected to draw any other conclusion than that in the Great War of 1914 to 1918, the British West Indies and other colonies of the mother country were conspicuous by their absence. Uh, and, and lastly, just to finish off, um, from 1923, the Imperial War Graves Committee, based in Baker Street at this point, met to discuss constructing memorials to the mercantile marine, missing or buried at sea. They agreed that the memorial should be sited in London with 12,000 names engraved on it. They believed that nearly all the relatives would at some time or other go to see it, arguing that relatives were more likely to see a memorial in London than elsewhere. The Commission also made clear that the proposed memorial in London was only for 11,900 Europeans. Natives, meaning 2,255 Lascar and West, in West African seamen, would have their own memorial at Bombay, and the 490 Chinese would have their memorial at Hong Kong. The Imperial War Graves Committee said it was unable to distinguish between Indians or West Africans. They acknowledged, therefore, that native meant Indians and West Africans. At a management meeting, officials suggested that the names of the Indian naval ratings of the Royal Navy might also go on the joint memorial in Bombay, <coughs> and if it was agreed, two West Africans might be allowed to, quote, slip into, unquote, the Bombay memorial. But it remained doubtful whether their names would be engraved in these cases owing to difficulty in verification. After this, West Africans are not mentioned in discussions of memorials east of Suez or in London. From 1923, discussions with Siemens organisations were carried out regularly in London regarding the type of memorial to be erected. From the outset, it was made clear that natives on the memorial were not up for discussion, only the 12,000 Europeans. Tower Hill was eventually chosen as the location for the memorial. It was unveiled on the 12th of December, 1928. Dominion representatives from South Africa, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and Newfoundland were invited, but not India or the colonies. This may be because it was designed as a quote from the Imperial War Commission, non-native memorial, unquote. However, if you look closely at the Roll of Honour, or get the chance to view the memorial, you will see Asian and African names. I am left wondering what did happen to the commemoration of West African seamen. And as you can see, there's a Ghanaian name there, uh, Gold Coast, uh, Aqua. Um, I'll come into that <laughs> <laughs> uh, There were efforts during the war to acknowledge the service of Africans and Caribbeans, but after the war, there is evidence of a deliberate policy of omitting that service in state-sponsored cultural memory of the war. This is, I believe, this, I believe, has led to a confusing popular memory in the present day of the participation of African and Caribbean uh, servicemen in the First World War. The memory of their service is trapped in a misleading collective memory of the conflict and a wall of whiteness which is difficult to penetrate. Um, there is a little mystery that needs solving, though. I, I visited Westminster Abbey uh, about three weeks ago, and I, I was asking to see the million dead uh, war tablet and, and the marshal didn't know where it was and one of them was very helpful and he took me into a room in the deanery where the uh, dean has his clothes prepared and there was this triptych there and if you look at the triptych you won't be able to see it but it has the million dead of empire but it also includes African colonies. Now I wrote to the uh, librarian of the Westminster Abbey and she has no idea what this is. There is no record of the gift whether in the uh, Commonwealth War Graves Commission, as it's known now, or in the West Westminster Abbey archives or library. So nobody knows who produced this monument or, or, or where it is from. Um, I'm also interested in this picture, which shows uh, Lascar seamen 
at the unveiling of the Tower Hill Memorial, even though they weren't invited. What does this say about how people saw uh, memorials, whether in an official or unofficial sense? Um, so I'll just end uh, by saying uh, that um, you know, even 100 years later, I, I believe there's still modern thinking in how to deal with the problems caused by the officials in those days, in the aftermath of the First World War. Uh, black colonial service needs to be commemorated properly and not tokenistically. Thank you.